So our next speaker is going to be uh, Carrie Christensen, um, who is a fellow DES daughter, I'm a DES daughter, and has been a leader in DES Action USA since 1980. Uh, and she's a member of MedShadow's Foundation Board of Directors. Related to Carrie's work at DES Action, she's also worked at the University of Wisconsin-Madison on the development of consumer and health professional DES educational materials and presentations for the NCI pilot DES education projects in the mid 1990s. She's been a member of the CDC's DES update task force. Um, and she was DES's uh, DES actions representative on the steering committee of the National Cancer Institute DES follow up study and the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences partners committee. So Carrie. Um, Marianne, are you still sharing screen? No, she isn't. I can't see her screen. Okay. Carrie, are you on mute? I'm here. I, no, I'm not. I'm not muted. I don't think. There you are. Are you? Okay. Yes. Go Hi. ahead. It's all yours. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, thanks, Sue. I'm not a scientist or a researcher, but I am a DES daughter and the aunt of two DES granddaughters, the daughters of my brother, who's a DES son. So research into any potential adverse effects of generational DES exposure is close to my heart. For over 40 years, DES Action has kept a record of the kinds of health questions asked by our members and inquirers. For many years, questions were primarily about adverse reproductive tract changes, cancer and infertility in DES daughters. However, because of, as we've heard, how many years DES was given to pregnant women, and I wanna point out that even though DES essentially was banned for, for pregnancy uh, in 1971, or for use during pregnancy in 1971, it was not withdrawn from the market. DES had first been approved for other uses, so it was still available, and there were still doctors who gave women uh, DES during their pregnancy. And I know of, of DES daughters and sons born into the early 80s. That, but because of this large age range, even from 38 to 71, of the prenatally exposed DES men and women, we had a large age range of questions. And so questions started about DES grandchildren almost as, as soon as DES action was formed 40 years ago. Most of those questions came from the mothers and the fathers of this third generation, the DES sons and daughters rather than directly from those generationally exposed. And I have to say that continued throughout the years I worked with DES and continue to work with DES Action. But I want to give you some of the examples of the kinds of questions DES um, received about DES granddaughters. Um, and these are miscarriages, cervical and vaginal epithelial changes, meaning the tissue changes, ectopic pregnancies, premature ovarian failure and ovarian cancer, endometriosis, bicornuate uterus, irregular menstrual cycles, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and a couple of cases of clear cell adenocarcinoma of the cervix in a young girl. Um, and many of these, some of them, not all, were similar to questions uh, that we'd seen from DES daughters or about DES daughters. The health questions uh, about DES grandsons from their parents included hypospadias, infertility or sterility, kidney cysts, autism, and gynecomastia. And these are indeed were some of the same questions that asked by DES sons. Um, so some of these grandchildren concerns were heard many times over the years, some occasionally and some only once. But all of these questions were shared with researchers, particularly at the National Cancer Institute and the National uh, Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And of course, our, our inquirers always ask, are these questions related to generational DES exposure? And how quickly can we know the answers? And aren't these good and complex questions? Indeed, these questions are the slippery slope of wanting to support the concerns of an inquirer without confirming that DES is specifically responsible for every adverse health effect. Asking questions is good, as long as we're open to the idea that there may be conflicting findings between studies, that we may not agree with the research results, and that all of our questions may never be answered. 
the unfortunate opportunity of having a DES exposed population is that we may be helpful in understanding some of the effects of all endocrine disruptors through generations. Studies have found indeed, as we've heard, that the timing of when DES uh, is first given during a pregnancy and the total dosage can have an effect on the severity of the adverse health outcomes in offspring. And indeed that same finding may be true um, and is true in this third generation. But not all studies have identical findings, even if asking the same questions. One difference as we've talked about uh, with, these, with our presenters is that how study participants are recruited, whether it may be by medical record review of DES exposure or by anecdotal reports from participants without necessarily having the medical records. Both types of studies are valid for sure, but interestingly, the findings may differ because of the way a research cohort was established. The co-founder of DES Action and a DES mother, Pat Cody, used to quote the adage, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Um, and when talking about DES health questions, all de epidemiological research is a methodical understand, undertaking, and perhaps most especially for generational DES exposure. Bob Hoover, the recently retired director of the National Cancer Institute, Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics, and the NCI um, project officer for the DES follow-up study, called this work panning for gold. Researchers have indeed learned a lot about DES exposure, and there is more panning for gold needed with generational exposure. Every DES study almost always ends with a call for additional research. I couldn't agree more. 